Hello there, and welcome to the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry interview series. I'm Ethna Trainer, and I'm going to be your host for this session. Well, we're absolutely delighted that you have joined us. And I'm just looking at the numbers here. And we have hundreds of people from around the world, actually. We have 43 countries registered. So this is really exciting. And um, I know everybody at the chamber is really delighted that you've taken the time to be part of this conversation, the Dubai um, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the interview series. Now, of course, this is a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews that the Dubai Chamber has put in place with leading and international figures and indeed all international figures there's so much that's going on here in dubai that we want to make sure we spread the world really talking to people from public and from private sectors and all of these topics of course relevant to business community both locally and internationally and our guests have a lot to talk about so let me get started on today's session because i'm very very excited about it we have with us the chief executive officer of the dubai future foundation but i'm going to hold on to him for just a few minutes because i have a lovely video i just want to share with you just an example of some of the tremendous work from the dubai future foundation let's take a look And of course, the work of the Dubai Future Foundation is every bit as vibrant and as exciting as you saw on that video. My guest today is really helping to transform business and organizations, all with the aim of contributing to Dubai's strategic and economic uh, diversity. He has a big agenda. I'm going to get right down to business and introduce to him, to you all. I know you're going to listen to him. He's the CEO of the Dubai Future Foundation, His Excellency Kalfan Belhul. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and I'm uh, honored and happy to, he to be here with you, and uh, please allow me to extend my thanks and appreciations to His Excellency Majid Saif al our dear friend and the Chairman of Dubai Chamber, His Excellency Hisham al-Shirawi, as well the Vice Chairman, and His Excellency Hamad al the President and CEO, dear friends and massive supporters of the Dubai Future Foundation, and also welcoming my um, other uh, friends and colleagues from uh, Dubai Chamber and the other guests joining us. Uh, in the panel and wishing everyone 
uh, that they are all well and safe in those challenging times and uh, subtly and quietly recommending everyone to get their vaccines and encouraging them. I just got mine, the second dose, I just literally got it today right before the show. I'm feeling perfectly fine. So um, uh, supporting uh, that mandate and wishing everyone as well. And what a great message um, you know, of hope and focus for us all. We all need to have that because we have a very dynamic system. We have a very dynamic city here and one that we all need to be very healthy to execute. And you definitely, when we look at the great work you have to do, and I know you have tremendous support from the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Talk to me though about the key sectors, the sectors that you're all looking at, the sectors that you look at um, in terms of why Dubai needs to, you know, what will help it become one of the leading cities in the world and particularly getting to, to grips with some of the key sectors that maybe we need to just put a little bit more effort into? Absolutely, that's a very important question. If you allow me to maybe give it a twist, uh, if you will, uh, not only focusing on the key sectors, but rather looking at how we need to adapt in the sectors that will always exist in our lives, whether it's healthcare, education, banking, logistics, transport, and what has happened to those sectors um, through the pandemic and going forward, and also the introduction of the fourth industrial revolution and the potential introduction of new sectors. So it's, 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 it's a combination of being agile and embracing the change in existing core structure, core sectors, um, understanding the needs of the new introduced sectors, and then what do governments do in all of that and what's our role? Because this is um, a, a big responsibility in, in the combination of the three, uh, let's say, mandates, if you will. So we start with the existing sectors, if you will. Um, obviously, the Dubai Future Foundation has learned so much in 2020. If we look at the upside of this year, if there are any, it's obviously, the um, first of all, the, the disruption of technology and what has happened in people creating technological solutions for industries to progress across education, academia, uh, um, sorry, uh, e-commerce, but also uh, understanding how we can uh, really adapt in challenging times and leverage um, uh, on technology. So through that, we've really um, uh, um, understood through 2021, what will, sorry, 2020, what will happen with the existing sectors, which gave us an indication that uh, education will be completely disrupted. In the past, let's talk with an existing sector like education. In the past, and, and I'll talk about myself, uh, mid 90s graduated and went to Boston to study um, simply because I wanted to explore good universities. Obviously now we're fortunate enough in the, in the UAE, we have amazing universities, maybe uh, um, less of options at that time, uh, but um, uh, with the push of leadership, obviously we have amazing universities uh, at the moment. But uh, my point is I had to physically uh, go somewhere and go to a boundary of a school to obtain my education. Education at the moment can be a click of a button away through an Ivy League. So but again, but I need to emphasize something. So, so the access to top tier education is no longer as hard as it used to be. It can come to you using technology. You can speak to the top professors, you can communicate with them. Having said that, we understand that education is not only about the content that gets disseminated from uh, universities and from professors. It's about your interaction, your social skills, your, the other qualities and the soft skills that you develop. And I give Boston a lot of credit for that because Boston is such a diverse city like Dubai and, uh, and all you see are students. So uh, it was so easy for me to interact with different students from this, different nationalities, the Africans, the Americans, the Asians. And I think that played a key role also in my upbringing, other than the actual education that I have uh, uh, received from uh, Boston University. So I think education, I focus maybe on this sector, major disruption going forward, dependent on technology. E-commerce, the same. Um, people at the moment um, buy online more than ever. The pandemic accelerated that as well. People um, right now, and I personally do that. I go to the shop and I shop. I look at the items. But sometimes uh, I end up uh, buying the same item from the same retailer, but through their online store. So the revenue generation for them is there, but the actual purchase rather than carrying bags all over the mall, it becomes an experiential uh, experience where then you do it online and order it at home, which means that there's innovation in what kind of experience you do in the brick and mortar retail experience and how you generate revenue through technology and e-commerce. 
banking, again, the same thing with the introduction of blockchain uh, and, uh, and, and the emergence of fintech. So, so those are existing disrupted uh, sectors that will always play a key role going forward, but we need to innovate and adapt and how they are provided. Now, when we come to the introduction of new sectors, or um, again, technology driven, is, is uh, when you talk about the artificial intelligence, what, what blockchain will do, 3D printing, and specifically robotics, what will robotics do to existing jobs? So we need to also embrace those technologies, and we cannot say that we need to reject them and, and, and continue working the way we can, uh, with the way we are, because if we do that, we won't be a leading city of the future, but we're, we're honored and, and fortunate to have leaders that create a lab out of our country where we're testing new ideas, which is really uh, the vision of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed transforming the city and the country to a lab for the world, which has more than 190 nationalities coming over and testing new ideas. So uh, maybe I took uh, long in this point, uh, Ethne, but I think the importance here is uh, disrupting existing set sectors, embracing new sectors and new technologies. And lastly, what do we do as government is we become extremely agile in, in, in creating the enabling environment, which is the role of the Dubai Future Foundation. And last but not least, do not forget the human angle into all of this and just get swamped into what technology will bring. At the end of the day, we're humans. We interact with each other through physical interaction. Through the pandemic, this was the, ma the most major loss because we were all at home and we really felt the value of human interaction because as much as we worked online, rubbing shoulders and discussing uh, on a physical basis has its own value and it's random discussions that can create value as well. What a very dynamic opening. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're all very, very excited to explore what we're doing there. But I love what you talk about too, that holistic approach and also really looking at Dubai because in a short time too, when you think about the development of this city too, it has moved very, very rapidly and it's moved fast. Just a quick note to our viewers out there. They can of course ask questions. We've got lots. I'm sure that people are very interested in terms of what the Future Foundation is doing. There's an area on the um, panel there to take your own notes, but make sure you do copy them down. And also there'll be an area for feedback. So we're really looking forward to that because we're planning on you know, a series of, of great dialogues to come. So we want you to be definitely involved. So when we look at the work of the Future Foundation too, and you talked about government and you talked about that agility too, how can government um, work with the private sector as well? Because ultimately you've got to bring those ideas and without a doubt, I think you're, you're, you're focusing them, you're challenging and challenge, challenging, um, making sure that they're challenged and channeled, so to speak, to make sure that they get to the right place because there's so many great ideas out there. Absolutely. Uh, a very important question. But if you also allow me, you mentioned one key point, which is how things have happened in such a short period of time in the country in a very fast pace. People around the world tend to maybe uh, underestimate this and maybe forget that this is a nation that's less than 50 years old and that not so long ago, this nation had depended on pearl trading for its business. And not so long ago in the discovery of oil, it was the main source of income. And if, if you, uh, if you uh, fast forward in this short period of time, we're having this dialogue right now with the introduction of AI and genome sequencing and blockchain and the fourth industrial revolution, all in a span of 50 years. So sometimes people take that for granted and it's, it's an appreciation to what leadership have done in such a short period of time since the founding fathers, his, the late designers, Sheikh Zayed Masultan, and the late Sheikh Rashid bin Saeed, and the, the, the major bets they've done in a desert, basically, uh, to build the World Trade Center and to build massive master plans to create the, the vision of UAE to where we are at the moment. Just a moment of appreciation of what you have mentioned over there. And with regards to the private sector, I think um, it's even more and more important at the moment there that, and it's inevitable that there should be hand-in-hand uh, -hand work between government and the private sector. It's more important than ever. You see the, the, the important um, of, of, of technologies, of the, the, the even social media, the data that's being uh, uh, accumulated through Facebooks and Instagrams and, 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 and even, uh, even uh, uh, other social media channels and the value that those bring to the, to the, to, to the ecosystem. There has to be a need, but, uh, uh, there has to be some kind of a link and a synergy between the government in order for us to leverage on this data 
in a most beneficial way going forward. And I re-emphasize on the word data because everyone talks about how the data is the new oil at the moment. And obviously it plays a massive role because with the amount of data that's being generated by the millisecond globally, major uh, beneficial decisions can be made. Uh, take a simple example, even for the vaccination program and for who wants the vaccine and who needs the vaccine more than other. The more we align in our data, which is a global challenge at the moment, the more uh, we will uh, create better results for the globe in a positive way. So at the Dubai Future Foundation, we embrace the private sector through several programs, one of which is the Dubai Future Accelerators, where we have seen um, um, thousands of startups from all over the world. And our goal in the Dubai Future Accelerators is to call out for um, uh, startups very agnostically through many sectors. So health, uh, security, um, 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 education, the municipality, um, uh, so on, and more than 13 sectors. And the idea is that we invite the private sector through entrepreneurs and startups to come in and solve for government related challenges, which is an extreme win-win situation because what happens here is first you create hope through the government and you are inclusive because it's very rare that you see uh, governments opening up their procurement capital, which is usually safe capital deployed to big institutions, but rather opening up, opening it up to give contracts to uh, smaller businesses with innovative ideas to one, uh, become more inclusive and secondly, to create hope for startups and to build innovation within their departments. And the idea is that if the startup uh, has a, a solution that can solve for a government challenge, it is given an MOU to start to test and then it's given a contract to generate revenue. Naturally, this creates uh, appetite to invest in the startup from venture capitalists. The more you generate revenue for the startup, the more it appreciates its value, the more there's appetite from a, a venture capitalist, which is an emerging asset class in the region. And we really, and in order for governments to really push for innovation and align with the fourth industrial revolution, more investment and more confidence and trust in this asset class needs to be built uh, in order for us to align with the vision of leadership. Um, to give even the city credit, uh, and the country, uh, if you look at the numbers and look at all the reports from the Magnet report, which is a prominent report here that looks at the, at the innovation ecosystem and the venture capital as a comparison to GDP and research as a comparison to GDP, it's a lovely report to look into and understand what the region is all about. Um, you would see that we do have a lead region-wise, but are we as a percentage comparison to a GDP uh, at the ratios of Israel and other countries that are known to be very keen on R&D and venture capital. As a ratio perspective, we're not there yet, but we have a regional lead, if you will. And uh, uh, the mandate is to raise the awareness, get the comfort from the private sector and the government to deploy into the space and build it more. So that's one partnership we have with, with the private sector to, to increase the belief in entrepreneurs and startups. And of course, that's a, a you know a partnership you have to strengthen and continually strengthen. But you can only do that to you know when the leadership is very open and the government is actually opening to ideas and asking for ideas and appointing you know something like the Dubai Future Foundation to actually make sure that this happens and you that you develop this thriving ecosystem. Talk to me about how perhaps this might be able to to help other governments in the region or indeed around the world because it is about opening. Their, you know, their eyes and ears, their, their arms, opening their doors, looking for new ideas, being prepared to be challenged as well. Talk to us a bit about that. So, so I think that there's, a, there's a very famous say, quote for uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed in Arabic. It, it says, Min al alla tukhatar, which is the biggest risks is not to take risks. And, and I think if this comes out from the leader, then this is a massive sign that we're thinking like entrepreneurs. And I think this was the recipe of success of the nation with God's blessing or to where we were and where we are, is that uh, big bets have been taken. And those big bets come with risks. But if we do not em embrace those risks and accept the risk, but mitigate it as much as we can, then we will not be leaders. So the fact that our leaders are thinking this way makes it so much easier for us as government entity responsible uh, individuals to actually try out new things, uh, let alone the sector that I'm involved in, which is, uh, which is uh, innovation driven, which means that there will be so many new ideas, so many uh, uh, failure rates, but we need to embrace failure and celebrate it because failure 
is considered um, uh, a learning curve. And for those that have failed, they will definitely succeed going forward. So I think, I think with that mindset, have we not made mistakes? Absolutely, we've made mistakes. Do we strive to be number one in everything? Yes, His Highness Muhammad wants us to be number one in everything. Does this mean that we will be number one in everything? Maybe not, but if we strive with that mindset to be number one in everything, and we'll definitely learn from the mistakes that we, 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 we make. In the, mind, uh, in the mindset of an entrepreneur, I think uh, those are the attributes of us setting an example for other countries to be a forward-thinking uh, country. Now, do you also see the role of the Dubai Future Foundation really helping to maybe influence you know, the development and the implementation of policies and strategies for the future? You know, is, is that part of the role? Oh, absolutely. It's a core component, Ethne. And I'll, and I'll, come, I'll come to the actual product that, that we, we, uh, we have, uh, uh, or we're, we're overseeing that's related to policies and regulations. But prior to that, emphasizing on the same point, uh, maybe the audience would typically think the, 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 uh, the typical challenge for an entrepreneur is financing. And they think there's maybe lack of investment in venture capital. Yes, that's a challenge, but it's not the biggest challenge. That's, that, that this will be, confidence will ra be raised with time. But what we've realized from the studies and from being on the ground with entrepreneurs, the biggest bottleneck for entrepreneurs are policies and regulations. And, and if you have a government that can amend regulations and policies in favor of innovations, you've picked a massive box for, for, for entrepreneurs. And with that, I'll, I'll tell you a story, uh, Anthony. I was honored maybe uh, um, a couple of months ago to take um, around 20 or 30 of the prominent venture capitalists of the region, uh, the entrepreneurs um, uh, and some individuals from the academia, people, the likes of uh, the founder of Wamba, Mr. Fadi Landur, the founder, the founder of Beko, uh, my dear friend as well, Danny Farha, the, the, the founder of Karim, uh, my dear friend Magnus as well. So, so entrepreneurs, academia, investors, uh, people that believed in the story of Dubai and the UAE. We gathered around a group of 30 and we took them on a cycling trip with the Crown Prince, His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed, who is also the chairman of Board of Trustees of the Dubai Future Foundation. And the idea was just to appreciate them and at the same time promoting health and well being. And went, we went on an amazing, a 15k cycling tour with his highness and it was supposed to be casual and just for his eyes to meet them and have a talk and send a message of appreciation to them so when we first went there and he met everyone and i and and, and, and this idea was also driven by my dear friend his excellency Hilal Murray, uh, who, who oversees dtcm as well and by world trade center an amazing uh, driver of the innovation ecosystem here and also a partner of the dubai future district initiative um, so when we introduced uh, the entrepreneurs to uh, his highness um, we I just I just uh, spoke and said your highness the individuals in front of you believe in the story in Dubai and contribute in different different ways than the others he went to them and he said one sentence and it resonated so much to them he went to everyone and he said ladies and gentlemen in Dubai anything can be changed and that's it and he said we're here to go cycling and we left. And I got calls from the people appreciating this so much because he didn't go technical speaking about what can be done. He's just giving them a sign of agility and willingness to change on what innovation needs. And that's all what they needed to, to hear. It's that we are willing to change things. And to that point, the, uh, at the Dubai Future Foundation, we have um, a vertical that has an initiative called the Regulations Lab. And the Regulations Lab speaks directly to the cabinet uh, of the UAE and is overseen by the Dubai Future Foundation. Its role is to amend regulation in favor of innovation. So if a blockchain solution comes in for, for fintech transactions, and if our uh, financial uh, authorities have regulations that do not complement this innovation, we need to have a discussion and change innovation. And they're completely supportive, whether it's the IFC or other financial, uh, um, or the DFSA or many other uh, supporting entities uh, we have a dialogue and we, we push a new regulation through the Reg Lab to be submitted to the cabinet, where at the cabinet, a temporary license will be awarded to test that idea. And then uh, the long term is to get a full time permanent solution. So, for example, if 3D printing, uh, and that's another story, 3D printing, obviously emerging technology. When we first did our first 3D printing building, uh, commercial uh, offices right next to Emirates Towers, 
when we first wanted to, 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 to set up the building, there wasn't a regulation for us to actually uh, register that building. So we actually registered it as a tent because there wasn't, because a, a, a typical building has specific regula regulations. But through this uh, entities like the Reg Lab, um, new regulations have been created for 3D printing, for, for blockchain, for uh, robotics. So the point here is absolutely policies are important. And the vehicle for us is regulation labs. We listen out to new regulations and amend them in favor of innovation. But it's great to hear and to listen to you talk about that agility and even to listen to you know, what you talk about, His Highness saying things can change. And that openness, I think, to change has always been, you know, uh, very much focus of Dubai, being able to be nimble and to actually move whatever direction because the world is changing so fast. Talk to me about Dubai's affiliate position, particularly when it comes to the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. This has been very important. Tell me just why it's important. Um, great question. Uh, just, uh, for, uh, just for the audience, the center has been uh, announced. Um, time flies. I think it was in, in, uh, in Davos. We were in Davos uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it was 2018. And we were honored to have Zainal Sheikh Hamdan there uh, meet uh, Professor Schwab to actually uh, attend the signing ceremony, of course, with the, with the presence of His Excellency Mohammed Al-Gurgawi, the Minister of Cabinet Affairs and the Managing Director of the Dubai Future Foundation and uh, um, a set of uh, uh, ministers as well who also are on our board of trustees at Dubai Future Foundation. And I think that's one amazing, um, uh, let's say, attribute of the Dubai Future Foundation is that we have more than 19 members of board of trustees spanning across director generals and ministers who really are our muscle uh, when it comes to support and soft power and building uh, relationships. So we cannot appreciate them enough and their efforts and their contribution. But with regards to the center, it was announced on the, um, in 2018 in Davos, and it's, uh, uh, the whole idea behind it uh, is, is, uh, are several things. One is it acted as, uh, uh, the indirect value is that it acted as a node when it comes to the World Economic Forum and a network hub to connect with other centers all around the world. And this is a very strong uh, value, if you will, to speak to like-minded people where centers exist all over the world. So, so that's one. Secondly, is we discuss topics that are relevant to the fourth industrial revolution and, to our, and that are relevant to our region. So the, the first three reports we're working on in the center and the center has its advisory board as well, which has more than uh, 18 members as well, uh, predominantly from the UAE um, uh, managing different uh, government entities and also uh, influential individuals across the globe and some from the World Economic Forum as well. And, and the idea is to focus in its first mandate on three topics, uh, 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 machine learning, uh, blockchain, and genome sequencing. And we've started with blockchain, and uh, we've, uh, uh, we've came out with a toolkit out of this based on best practices and studies globally. And uh, we've, uh, we've discussed it with government entities like DP World and other entities to actually test uh, that toolkit and, and, and also in partnership with the regulation lab to, ins to ensure that um, uh, blockchain can be deployed in the safest manner. And the beauty of the center is that global validation happens uh, imminently because of the relationship we have with WEF, who are a main driver uh, of the fourth industrial revolution. No, and it's actually, it's great to see how, you know, you can actually make sure that it has been rolled out to look at public and private enterprise, you know, particularly adopting, you know, and designing policy and all that absolutely essential. Talk to me about the initiative to have 1 million Arabs uh, in terms of being qualified to be able to code. I mean, this is ambitious, yes. but uh, you're, you're driving this too. Absolutely. Uh, now the 1 million Arab coders obviously was one of the first initiatives uh, at the Dubai Future Foundation. As, and as we know, coding is the language of the future. Um, um, getting uh, enough coders uh, into this uh, ecosystem creates value in so many ways. And the whole idea behind this program is, first of all, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a tool to get people ready for something that will be relevant to the future, that's one. Secondly, uh, to the innovation ecosystem, uh, there's always a, a linkage between coders uh, and entrepreneurs. And sometimes you have the skill set of an entrepreneur who's a good leader, he has the right charisma to lead the business, but he lacks maybe the technical skills and vice versa. So, so the whole idea was for us to graduate those people 
and uh, and then infuse them with our other programs that are uh, running the accelerators and the incubators so, so that we can create that that harmony between technical people and entrepreneurs that can lead businesses and come up with 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 the successful startups so that, that's the idea of it uh, like uh, what has been mentioned amazing numbers north of 800,000 uh, uh, enrollees the, the program has has uh, has rolled out globally as well with country partnerships whether with Uzbekistan who are doing an amazing job and that's one idea of, of, of discussing initiatives with like-minded people that believe in the same vision we run the program in partnership with Uzbekistan as well we've done it as well with Jordan and one of the most touching moments for me personally as well is when we also uh, I personally went to the refugee camp as well in Zatari in, in Jordan and I, I visited them there and, and we created a direct program for refugees to contribute as well through the coding initiatives and nothing will make me happier than seeing them uh, actually uh, uh, get infused as well uh, into the market and creating out of their skills uh, businesses. So that's also something that's very special to me and the team at the Attach personally. So we look forward to the progress of this program. And, and that is so wonderful because talent is indeed, it's, it's all around us and sometimes in the most you know unusual places that and again the most deserving places where you really need to look so well done on that initiative i think it's going to be very successful but talk to me about you know the dubai future academy and when we look at you know the university entrepreneur program and all of that and people look at the great work you're doing is this exclusively for emiratis who's involved how can people work with you talk to me a little bit about that because i know there's a lot of people watching out there that are you just looking in amazement at the great work that you've done? Thank you, thank you. So, so to that point, uh, first of all, it's not only for Emiratis, it's a program that supports all. Um, and naturally, when you support all, it complements Emiratis naturally because they get to rub shoulders and, and interact. And this is, it's beneficial for everyone once, once you create that kind of uh, uh, interaction. So um, uh, you've mentioned two things, Ethne, the academy and the university program. So I'll, I'll differentiate and what is the role of each and every one of them. So the academy, if you will, is the third pillar of the Buy Future Foundation. So we do have the research, we have the content dissemination, then we have the education, and then we have the building the innovation ecosystem through the regulation labs and the accelerators. And lastly, we have the Museum of the Future, which I'm sure we'll tap uh, onto at, at some point. Um, but uh, with, with the academy, the whole idea is to educate um, uh, the audience about uh, the future. If, if we are going to talk about uh, being agile, being adapted to the future, we need to create an educational mechanism to get our people ready for the future. And this does not mean uh, that they should understand technologies only or the fourth industrial only. It sometimes also means that there should be a mindset and an adaptation switch to embracing um, the change that's happening because sometimes people are, are resistant to change and, and, and resistant to change. So we, we need to ensure that people accept change because we cannot uh, stay where we are. We need to continuously uh, move forward. We cannot stick to jobs that we understand are inevitably gonna be dissolved and replaced by technology. We need to reskill and readapt. So, so the academy creates is, is basically a beacon and an opening for for programs and one of its initiatives is to communicate directly with the human resources department of the government of Dubai to create programs specifically dedicated to government entities where we can graduate people to make them future ready and aligned to the future if you will and that's one stream of it across other streams that we focus on tapping uh, uh, into the private sector as well and, and preparing them for the future. That's on the academy side. Now the university program um, is, is, is a very exciting program for us as well. It was part of the 50th charter, the charter announced by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed uh, to transform the universities into entrepreneurial uh, hubs. And the idea behind this is um, we realize now through the, through the disruption of technology that um, successful startups do not necessarily need to wait uh, 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 for, uh, to graduate for them to become good uh, business people. You look at the likes of Bill Gates, you look at Facebook and the challenges he had at universities and where he has reached with his business. So the idea is you don't need one or the other. You can do both at the same time. So you cannot give up your education for the sake of entrepreneurship and you do not need to wait till you graduate 
for you to run your business. We can do both together. And clearly, we've seen that people used to challenge this in the past. So the role of this program is to create entrepreneurial hubs, uh, get people to, uh, and the students to be more curious about business, to start testing their ideas, affordable license for them to start up their businesses and register their companies, and potentially as the value, and also with funding mechanisms through Dubai SME and beyond, to, uh, to have grant mechanisms to start with all the way to proper VC financing as they grow, and then funneling them to the ecosystem. So the idea is uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, weighs uh, or falls hand in hand with education. And the idea is also to discuss with the universities that even if those entrepreneurs uh, fail in the business, it's still credit and learning curve for them. And that's the most important attribute. We cannot say that a successful business means that you get credit. It's the learning curve that you've gotten through that process is what gives you uh, credit as an entrepreneur. So that's the program and it funnels through our acceleration program as well. Indeed, yes, indeed, the perfect name for it to the acceleration program. So no standing still and certainly no looking back regret on that. It's about you know grasping what's there and going for it. I'm getting some questions coming in, which is wonderful from our audience. And um, you know, we've only got about 20 minutes left, left. So let me start putting some of them to you. We have a question from Kamal Kant. It's uh, here in the UAE from Network International. Are you taking equity in many of the startups in the UAE? Specific question there. That's a very good question. Um, for now, the answer is no. Potentially in the future, yes. But this is a bit of a technical question and I'll, and I'll try to be very brief with my answer. So we will not take typical equity. What we will take, we will complement businesses. So what I mean is, as um, I, I'm not sure if the audience have heard, uh, same time last year, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in the presence of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, the Dubai Future District has been announced with the launch of a billion dirham fund, which is supposed and planned to uh, uh, boost and catalyze the innovation ecosystem through equity financing, but in a very uh, double bottom line strategy, not focused on IRRs and multiples, but rather a combination of IRR, but more patient capital and, and, and strategic uh, impact driven uh, investment. And, and the reason I'm saying equity is that, yes, there will be equity, but we will not be competing with the typical VCs. So the idea is that we have three buckets in this fund. One bucket will be to anchor funds in the region. And, the, and, and this will be uh, obviously investment as an LP in a fund, but at the same time, our management of success of that commitment will not only be driven by the IRRs and the multiples of that underlying fund, but rather, how much have we raised awareness in an emerging market in the private sector to deploy into that fund as well? Because naturally, when some entity like Dubai Future District or Dubai Future Foundation uh, deploys into a, 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 a fund, it raises com comfort levels for the private sector to also uh, uh, invest, which is a metric of success in an emerging asset class for us. So we look at how much we have improved the raising and the investing in local VCs as a second metric of success. Secondly, we invest directly into startups, but complementing VCs. So what we do is we look at funding gaps. So if we see that there's appetite in Series A financing uh, and there's less of an appetite in Angel or vice versa, then we come in to plug that gap to ensure that there's harmony in the growth of a startup and, and the cycle of growth for the startup uh, uh, happens. We also do matching schemes if a fund also invests we also uh, uh, match them. And at the same time, if we see that a fund is raising a specific round uh, for a startup and there's pro rata where we can get in because uh, that they're unable to close that round, we come in and we plug that hole. That's obviously IRR and return for us, but at the same time, the KPI is that we've helped the startup to jump into the second round of financing. So this is all equity, but it's equity slash impact. I don't want to go into much detail, but to show you it's a balance, it's a double bottom line strategy. And lastly, through this fund, we can also look at a global fund of fund program, but also with a, uh, with, a, with a strategic eye that we will cherry pick funds that have synergy through underlying companies, portfolio companies that can grow in the region and with partnerships at the GP level that we believe can create value as well regionally and globally. So it's all strategic. It's very exciting for us because um, it's the first of its kind for, for the region. And I think it can do wonders if it's de deployed in the right way. 
And as you can imagine, on a live forum like this, you're creating great anticipation out there with people. So not surprisingly, I'm getting a few questions in here in terms of how can people get involved and how can they approach you? I have a question here from Grant Vandervault um, in the Be Change group, also looking at you know startup companies uh, in terms of how they can help in different markets and raising capital, but how do we get involved? And another question on a similar note too from Matthew Matthews from uh, Logis I also asking about you know innovative startups and how does one how does one approach you? What what do you want from companies? What are you looking for? How do they just rock up and knock on your door and say I have a, a great idea? So give us a feel for what they need to do in advance before they come to you. Well, the big, biggest way, my friend, or the easiest way we use, you use technology now is our website, and it has everything that I've explained across all our verticals, explains every mandate, the regular, the future accelerators. Um, there's also the Dubai Future District website, which focuses on the fund as well. So I, I recommend looking, looking at that as well. So the Dubai Future Foundation and the Dubai Future District. And, and um, um, obviously, more than happy to share contacts, post email offline to ensure that we, there's also email communications. But obviously, there's an email in the website as well. And I'll, I'll make sure the team pays close attention to any contacts we receive on email that are relevant to this interview. So if you can kindly mention that maybe on the email um, so to ensure that we cover uh, uh, everyone that has been with us here today. Obviously, we pay attention to everyone, but it's nice to understand where the source of this request has come from. So definitely looking forward to the, to the points discussed. Another question I have here, and it comes from Patrick Okeke, and uh, looking at any programs that might attract innovations from Africa. And I bet there's plenty of people from different countries probably asking themselves the same question right now. Um, what can they do? Is it more just get involved and connect with you guys? And, and, if you, and what are you looking for, though? So I think, I think my best advice for, for innovations from all over the world is to check out our Dubai Future Accelerators program. We are in our eighth cohort at the moment, and the, the, the program is 80% global. So I'd say 20% of the program is from the region. So it shows that there's a sign of collaboration and inclusivity, and, and it's extremely diverse uh, from, a, from a continent perspective. So check out the program, and, and, and the program launches challenges uh, agnostically through different sectors. So if that sector is relevant to you, please feel free to apply to it because we have a, a team that, that meets all entrepreneurs and startups and, um, and, and we, we validate and vet those ideas. And I'll be very frank, uh, Anthony, when we first launched this program, we, we faced a major challenge in the filtration of the quality of the startups. And the reason being is the, start, the, the, the startup, it was a nine week program where we, through the accelerators, we paid for tickets, we paid for accommodation for those entrepreneurs and to come in to solve a challenge specifically. So let's take an example, Dubai Health Authority launches an AI uh, solution for a diagnostic of um, disease X. And we get uh, uh, startups coming in with solutions. We vet them, the ones that uh, pass come in, nine weeks of testing with the government entity. They succeed, they sign an MOU, they get a pilot test and they get awarded and then VCs look at them and we create a successful story. But when you create a value proposition like this, um, you attract everyone, the good ones and the not so good ones. So you have prominent startups, you have good ideas, but you also have people that come in and set up a, a, a company a day after they've heard the news because the value proposition of coming to Dubai and enjoying Dubai by itself is valuable for them. So, so you get so many ideas. So my point is there's always a filtration that has to happen due to the attractiveness of the value proposition. Uh, so we will do that. So feel free to reach out to us. I'm looking forward to um, um, assessing those ideas. And obviously, I think people need to keep in mind, of course, you know, the quality that Dubai wants, the quality that Dubai intends to launch out there. So um, a lot of homework to have done in advance before they actually come to you without a doubt. I think that's that's very, very valid here. Is Dubai Future um, Foundation helping startups to sign MOU with government entities? And this is a question from Hamad. Hamad. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, 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 that's clearly the Dubai Future Accelerators program. Don't quote me on the figure, but it's a three digit figure when it comes to uh, the amount of MOUs we've signed with government entities to give startups the hope to start the interaction. 
Now, the key is not the MOU. The key is signing the pilot test right after that. So the MOU is the intent and the understanding. And then um, it's the signing of the pilot test with the government entities. And then the signing of the larger contract that generates revenue. So, so we do all that, uh, but it all depends on how well the startup does in its idea and its, and its selling skills to the government entity. But I, 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 I guarantee you that the teams that we have from the government entities um, are teams that understand entrepreneurship and understands the risk behind new ideas and are open uh, to that risk because this is what creates uh, an innovative department out of that government entity. Now, I know, of course, you said you're open to people from anywhere around the world. And the question that's come in here from um, the Khalid Times, uh, Mosafer Rizvi, talking about, uh, you know, the startup ecosystem in Dubai. Do you expect significant contribution and collaboration with Israeli startups? This is the door has now opened and uh, a lot of work going on and tremendous interest coming from Israel. Well, uh, obviously, we've had and um, I cannot ex yeah, and explain to you how many discussions I've had in that regard because of the relevancy of my sector at Dubai Future Foundation. Um, uh, clearly, the numbers in Israel when it comes to uh, percentage uh, ratio uh, of GDP in BC, ratio of GDP on, in R&D is the highest globally as a ratio. Uh, their keenness on agri-tech, on, on, on robotics is huge as well. And the, and the, the learning uh, uh, curve that they have had through their programs, uh, whether it's the Startup Nation or, or, or uh, any other programs that are within the Israeli innovation ecosystem, there's so much uh, knowledge that has been uh, captured over there. And the idea is to create a two-way dialogue, which we, which, which we have been uh, doing, which is... Uh, understanding the, the knowledge and the experience that has been built in Israel to build the innovation ecosystems because we are heading in a similar track when it comes to the focus on deployment of VC and R&D and the focus is there. But at the same time, um, they are very keen as well in understanding the, the pace of growth in the United Arab Emirates and the transformation that has happened in such a short period of time and the potential opportunities that can be explored through ideas generated in the UAE, startups incubated from all over the world in the UAE and their synergies with, uh, with uh, Israel and what, how they can grow within Israel as well. So there's a very interesting two-way dialogue, but definitely uh, so much to learn from what has happened there. And, 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 and definitely we are having uh, many discussions. Um, a question from a Lebanon consultant here, Hussein Basma, looking at crowd crowdfunding platforms, particularly when it comes to government projects. Crowdfunding, is this something of interest here or it's happening? It's inevitable. I think crowdfunding uh, is something that we have to uh, uh, pay attention to uh, across uh, many sectors, across um, uh, the, 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 typically on a, on a financial center perspective, but also in supporting uh, new ideas that come um, at the Dubai Future Foundation and opening up the opportunity for um, uh, micro investors to get involved through uh, investments and through supporting the innovation ecosystem, because that's typically what crowdfunding does. Uh, uh, you do not need to be an institution to commit your capital to, uh, to grow a business. There are platforms that can help you uh, uh, contribute, and we are surely exploring it uh, in many sectors, whether it's in FinTech, whether it's on, also on the gaming sector, which by the way, uh, gaming is a massive sector as well going forward and we're paying close attention to it and how we can leverage on that but uh, crowdfunding is a, an, an agnostic platform that serves across uh, all sectors that is truly important going forward now you mentioned earlier the museum of the future and of course when we think of museums typically we we tend to be looking backward but of course in dubai we're looking at a museum of the future and for anybody who has not seen the building uh, itself they need to start to do a quick check on the internet and that and just look at the magnificence of that. Talk to me a little bit about that and the advantages that it will bring. Anthony, they don't, they don't really need to go to the internet. I can just go back a bit and show them the building. It's right there behind me if you can see it. But uh, it's, it's, not, it's not as visible, but uh, um, uh, we're so looking forward to this building. And you, you, you nailed it with your uh, comment by saying that this is a museum that focuses on the future. And this is the uh, biggest challenge that we have because if you think about it, um, great museums, like let's take the Louvre, for example, the value of the assets 
uh, invested in, in the museum appreciate in value with time. So the owner of the museum, uh, the amount of investment that needs to be done is that major capital uh, investment in the beginning um, in those assets. And those assets will be self-generating and appreciated more and more as they grow older, which means that the management of this is really to add a few pieces here and there, and your business model will continue to be successful. And this museum behind me is completely the opposite. What's futuristic today is probably not futuristic three months from now, which means if I'm carrying the future mandate, I need to ensure that I have a very smart, uh, logistically and financially, uh, 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 let's say, approach to ensure that my content is continuously future uh, relevant and that there's a way to change it in a very agile way because what's futuristic today, like I said, is not tomorrow, is not futuristic very soon. So how can we really manage that value proposition? And without, without stealing the thunder of, of, of the opening, which we look forward to in alignment with Expo uh, sometime this year, um, uh, the idea of this uh, building is that it will be a, an immersive experience of a far future, which we call more of a dream where people will get to imagine how the future will look like in different sectors. And I'm not going to reveal what those sectors are. Uh, there's also an immersive experience to get into that environment, which I'm not going to reveal as well. Once you, once you go through that experience of the far future, then you come to an area where you're more closer to the near future and the more tangible future. So we want people to get a sense of how the far future looks and then what the near future looks, which is plus three or five years from now. So they can actually feel and touch ideas that are closer to our future. So it's a combination. Uh, it's an experience that is more than two hours. There's a dedicated uh, space also for um, uh, kids to enjoy their time. Uh, while while uh, 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 elder ch children and, and adults can experience the, the other side of the museum. So, so much content, very challenging because the building looks extremely beautiful and unique from the outside. So to match that from the inside is an extreme challenge, but I believe the team has done an amazing job with the push of leadership and we can't wait uh, for it to be open. And you're definitely at the invited uh, to join us um, uh, if you are in town at that time and looking forward to inviting the rest of the guests attending here as well. Oh, indeed. I mean, this is one we definitely wouldn't miss. We've been watching this, you know, week by week, month by month. It's been quite exceptional to actually see the development. And again, for many of the viewers around the world who can't look out your window, definitely worth a look. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And I want to, to wrap this up also in terms of looking forward to, to later this year to Expo. Expo has so much going on. We're going to have six months where there's a big focus here in Dubai. We are going to carry on. And I'm sure that some of the great minds of the world are going to be coming here. What do you hope for Dubai Future Foundation and the people that you're going to meet and interact with during Expo? What are your expectations? Well, first of all, I cannot appreciate Expo enough and the level of effort that's been done with the push of leadership and the team at Expo led by Her Excellency Reem, who's, uh, who's a dear friend and I always wish her the best. And she's done such an amazing job uh, uh, with the team. Um, and as we see uh, Expo is gradually opening different sites. I haven't had the chance to visit it yet, but definitely looking forward. I've passed by a few times at the construction site. It's such an amazing place and, and uh, uh, looking forward to bringing the whole world to Dubai and the UAE uh, uh, at its opening. Obviously, it's a, it's a big sign. The theme of Expo is very complementary to what we do at the Dubai Future Foundation. So definitely looking forward to many synergies. There are so many dialogues that we're having with the Expo team across all verticals, linkage with the Museum of the Future, packages potentially for, for visitors to come here and there. So, so many dialogues. We cannot not be part of this. The whole UAE is behind Expo and we definitely are at Dubai Future Foundation. And of course, when we look to the future, there is, it's, it's, it's big, it's wide, it's, uh, you know, that, that great dynamic sort of uncertainty that's there, I think, you know, you look at really as a huge opportunity. And I guess that's the mindset we all need to get. Absolutely. The, the biggest variable in, in the future is the unknown, Ethne. And, and uh, the further you go, the more the unknown uh, is visible. And that's what we talk about in the future. But again, you need to do your best in assessing it. And you need to do your best in, in taking those bets and mitigating the risk. And this is what our leaders have, learned, have taught us. And we need to continue doing this if we want to uh, grow uh, in the way that we have fortunately grown since the formation of the UAE. So we will continue doing that. 
Well, thank you so much. And indeed, you know, under your leadership, I know the Dubai Future Foundation will continue to grow and continue to thrive. It's been such a delight to have you here as part of the interview series for the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I know all of the team and the leadership at the chamber is so grateful to you and so delighted to have with us here His Excellency uh, Kalfan Belhul, the CEO of Dubai Future Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you for moderating this amazing uh, session. Enjoyed having it with you, and uh, thank you again for Dubai Future Foundation. Uh, sorry, Dubai Chamber. And uh, stay safe, everyone, and don't forget to get vaccinated. That's my last message. And stay safe. That's that's the big message that comes here, so we can all thrive together. Once again, thank you so much, and uh, keep an eye on all of the great work that's going on at the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and we'll keep you up to date with great interactions throughout the year. So stay tuned. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much.